Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that we have this time that we can open Your Word, we can study Your Word. Um, Lord, in addition, we get to pray and fellowship with one another. I, I ask of You this morning as um, I teach, it would be Your words and Your Spirit that would speak. I pray for each of the young men and women um, in this room, in order that um, where they need to be challenged, You will challenge them, and where they need to be comforted, You will comfort them. Where we need to grow in their faith and their knowledge of You, that You would make that happen in each one of their lives. Thank you for their dedication to you and their discipline to be here this morning and <clears throat> their willingness to sit and listen to the Word. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you rested well last night? If you didn't rest well, why, why did you not rest well last night? Tell me a few reasons why you might not have rested well last night. Yeah. Uh, I was driving back from Waco and got back late. Okay, got back late so I didn't get as much time to sleep in. What about another? Well, what's another reason you didn't? Disturbances in the neighborhood, okay. What else? What else is the reason you didn't sleep well, Evan? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Drink two cups of coffee and didn't sleep well last night. <clears throat> um, I, I did not. I, I rarely ever sleep well in the night before I teach. I'm rehearsing and then going through notes and figuring out that it goes better here or there and so forth. So, um, you know, it, it happens. You do not rest well. And today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about rest. Uh, that's going to be the emphasis is entering God's rest. And the question for you is, have you? Have you entered God's rest? And that will ultimately be what the writer of Hebrews is asking in this text for us this morning in chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> Before we do, let's take a minute and just review Hebrews 2 and 3, 1, 2 and 3 a little bit. The book of Hebrews is written to Jews, both believing Jews and non-believing Jews. Those that had put their faith and trust in Christ, <clears throat> there was still the pull back to Judaism. And so the Hebrew writer is writing to them and talking about how Christ is superior to all the things that used to be important to them. He is superior to the law. He's superior to <clears throat> the patriarchs. So they use the Moses as an example. He's superior to the angels. All through the book of Hebrews will continue to see that Christ is superior to, and you will fill in the blank as we continue to make that study going forward. It also is set with warnings in the book of Hebrews. There are warnings to those Jews that this book is being written to. In some cases, it will be addressed to the holy brethren, meaning those that have come to Christ. And in other places, it'll just be addressed to brethren, such as the family or kinsmen, meaning the other Jews that are in there and a, and a part of it, but are not saved. They have not come all the way to Christ. They have begun to leave. They've, they've known about the Messiah. They have begun to leave the Judaism religion, but they have not been saved. They have not come all the way to Christ. And there's a number of warnings in the book of Hebrews one of the reasons that this was so important to the new Hebrew Christians is because they were being greatly persecuted. If you were a Hebrew, if you were a Jew and you were saved, then you would no longer be allowed to go into the tabernacle. You would no, no longer be, go, be able to go into the temple to pray. And this is something you've done every day of your life for many of them and multiple days of your life for a long, long time. And now you're being told you can't come in. And so it's very upsetting to them. Not only that, but they're now being ostracized by their family. They will not have anything to do with them anymore because they have left the Jewish faith and are now following the Christian faith. That is a going on for them. And so this book is written to encourage those new Hebrew Christians that your Savior is superior to everything else that you've been studying in the past. And you should be encouraged by that. And you should draw strength from that. And so that's why it starts out as it does um, talking about <clears throat> the superiority of Christ. But as I mentioned, there are six warnings. Some say five, some say six. I'm going to go with six today. May change my mind later. But the first warning came to us in chapter 2, and it was the warning of neglect. Hebrews 2, 3 says, How can you neglect so great a salvation? That was the first warning that was issued here in the letter the book of Hebrews. There are dire consequences for the Jew, and we can extend that to the Gentile, but in this case, written to the Jews, 
who hears the gospel, the presentation of life, death, and resurrection of Christ, but does not commit their life to Him, but instead drifts away from the truth like a ship without a moor to the harbor. That's the picture that it paints for us in Hebrews 2, as if the ship pulled into the harbor, but no one tied it down. And so as the wind comes and the sea goes out, the ship just begins to drift away and drift away into the sea of destruction. And that are those who come and hear the Word of Christ, but never believe. They have neglected so great a salvation. One of the things I want you to look at as a Bible student, okay, so I like to give, this is good for me, I hope it'll be good for you. In the book of Hebrews, every time we get to one of these warnings, you should look for, obviously, what's the warning? But number two, I want you to look for what are the consequences of the warning? What are the consequences if you do nothing? And then number three, what's the remedy? Every one of these are going to give us a consequence and a remedy. Okay. So in the case of neglect, what's the consequence of the warning? Well, disobedience to the message of the Messiah from the angels. Okay, When the angels spoke of it and they disobeyed and they neglected the message of the coming Messiah, there was retribution. And it goes on in, in chapter 2 to say, how much more will God's judgment be on those who reject the true Messiah, reject the message of Christ? That neglect ends up in eternal separation from God. That's the consequence of neglecting so great a salvation. So what's the remedy? Well, it tells us in verse 1 there, it goes on to say, be diligent, pay attention to what you have heard. In the case of our study, the reading and preaching and the truth of the Word of God. So be diligent. Pay attention to what you've heard and dwell on those words. That's the warning. Be diligent is going to come up again in, in chapter 4. It's going to be a recurring theme. The second warning came in chapter 3. Starts in verse 7, goes all the way through into chapter 4. We're still under the premise of the second warning in our text for the day. And that is the warning of unbelief and disobedience. You have heard the gospel, you know the truth of Christ's work, but you love the sin in your life more, or you fear persecution by your family or co-workers or friends, and you do not repent of your sins and commit your life to Christ. Unbelief and disobedience. You never come to belief. And there's also an urgency in this warning, and that is you should do this today. You shouldn't wait for tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. This warning... Is, both to, is addressed to the Jews, both the saved and the unsaved, but the warning is critical to those who do not know Christ. The warning is issued to you as Christians because we are part of the remedy. You know what the remedy is for this consequence? The remedy is for you to be out exhorting and encouraging people to come to know Christ. That's what Hebrews tells us in chapter 3. I exhort you and I encourage you to be sharing with others. You are, and I am, part of the remedy. So what's the consequence? You will not enter into God's rest. You will not enter into God's rest. Eternal rest with God. That's the consequence of the second warning. John MacArthur writes on chapter 3, in the midst of this warning, he says, The Holy Spirit is saying to everyone who hears the gospel, Respond to Jesus while your heart is still warmed and softened by His truth. While it, is, while it is still sensitive, respond to His sweet love and His call of grace. Wait too long and you will find your heart getting hard and insensitive. The decision will become harder and harder as your heart becomes harder and harder. He goes on to say, if you continue to follow your evil, unbelieving heart, Rather than the gospel, you will forever depart from the living God and forfeit salvation rest. God's rest. God's eternal rest. Now, in chapter 3, many of the Old Testament verses that are being quoted here are from Psalm 95. Okay, Psalm 95, written in the time of David. Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. Those are what is quoted here for us in chapters 3 and chapter 4. Let me just give you a little context on what is going here. Israel had been in Egypt for more than 400 years, and for 200 of those years they had been slaves. 
Afraid that the Hebrews would become a threat, the Egyptians tried to weaken them and deplete their numbers by hard, oppressive labor. They were overworked, underfed, and beaten. As both punishment and as inducement to let the people leave, God afflicted the Egyptians with a series of plagues. Pharaoh pleaded with the Israelites to leave which they hurriedly did under Moses' leadership. By the time they reached the Red Sea, Pharaoh had changed his mind, led his troops to bring them back. We know, parting of the Red Sea. God performed another miracle, allowed his people to travel through the parted waters, which afterward engulfed and drowned the pursuing army of the Egyptians. After they arrived for the trial in the wilderness, God continued to bless them with miracles, direction by pillars of cloud and fire for night travel and provision of food and good water. After each blessing, they were satisfied only for a very brief time. They soon started to complain and to doubt God. They became the classic illustration of unbelief in the face of overwhelming evidence. God had clearly and miraculously revealed Himself. They knew He had revealed Himself. They knew what He expected them to do. And they saw evidence and evidence of His power and His blessing, but they never really believed. Just as the Egyptians quickly got over their fear of God, the the Israelites quickly got over their trust of God. They would not commit themselves to Him in faith. As a result, they had to wander and wonder until all the ungrateful, untrusting, unbelieving generation had died. And when he says, truly, they will not enter my rest, they never did enter the rest of the promised land because of their unbelief. That is the warning. That is the context. So whenever I'm talking to, the, to a Jewish community and they're sitting here and I begin to tell them, you're not going to enter God's rest, they begin to immediately go into their mind what happened to the Israelites. They never were able to enter into God's rest. Psalm 95, I'm going to read for you verses 7 through 11. For He is our God, and we are His people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you would hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my work. Okay, there's your evidence. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, truly they shall not enter my rest. Okay? They shall not enter my rest. What happened was the people were thirsty. They complained and grumbled because they had no water to drink after all God had done with them. They asked him, why have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock? God told Moses to strike the rock and the water will come out. And God named this place Massa and Meribah, the names he uses in Psalm 95 because those two words represent rebellion and disobedience. That's what he named the place, the place of rebellion and the place of disobedience. As one of the commentators said, and I put this in your notes, unbelief never has enough proof. Think about that for a minute. Unbelief never has enough proof. There can't be enough proof for unbelief. It has to be a softened heart that comes to know Christ through faith and faith alone. So let's look at our text, chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, I want to read 1 through 10 um, this morning. Therefore... And remember, Bible students, we always want to know which of therefore is therefore, right? So we'll answer that in just a minute. Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to be failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed entered that rest, as He has said... As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today, saying, Through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. 
For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Okay, we're going to untangle some of that for you. There's a little bit of uh, help I, I think we can bring through a few um, explanations of these. But let's start with the very beginning, okay? First of all, we want to look at God's promise. Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, the promise has been made by God that there is still opportunity for you to enter God's rest if you have not already. The door is not closed. There's the promise that this is still available to you. Not just available, but it's promised to all those who put their faith and trust in Him. Now this word of rest is the basic idea of ceasing from work or any kind of action. You stop doing what you are doing. The action, the labor, the exertion, it's over. And applied to God's rest, it means no more self-effort as far as salvation is concerned. It means the end of trying to please God by our feeble fleshly works is over. God's perfect rest is a rest in grace. Okay? So let's look at verse 1, the therefore. The therefore is bringing into play for us from chapter 3 in the midsection where we talk about the second warning all the way into today. So all these talked about in that part about Israel and what Israel has done and how Israel was disobedient, that is coming into the therefore. And he continues on to say, Therefore, lest we fear, lest us fear, lest you fear. Okay? Why does it start with let us fear? And what is there to fear? What, what is there to fear? What should you be afraid of? Well, as an unbeliever, you should be afraid of not entering God's rest. That's what you should be very afraid of. Those who have lost, they face eternal separation from God. Lest, let us fear lest any of you should have seen, have failed to reach it. Reach what? Entering God's rest. If you have failed to enter it, you should be fearful. There should be a fear in your heart right now if you have any doubt about whether or not you're a believer. And you would fail to enter God's rest. But those who have put their faith in Christ, have put their trust in Him, you have nothing to fear. Nothing at all. God promised us in Ephesians 1.13 that we have been sealed. The King's seal. We will receive an eternal inheritance. We will be God's child. God's own possession. And we have nothing to fear. But those who are without Christ, they should be very fearful. So what is required to receive this promise of entering God's rest? What's required to do that? You must believe. Verse 2 says that they were not united by faith. And verse 3 explains on those who believe will enter the rest. Believe what? Will believe that God sent His Son, Christ, to live a perfect life and believe that Christ died a sacrificial death for the forgiveness of our sins. Believe that His resurrection conquered death and provided eternal life to all those who put their faith and trust in Him. It also means that you have humbled yourself before God and repented of the sin of your life. Submitted your life to Christ to honor, serve, and worship Him until you're called to be with Him in heaven or He returns. And all of this is done as a free gift of grace to you. No works, no baptism, no second blessing, nothing. Nothing is required to you except to believe. Verse 3 says, For we who have believed... Enter that rest. Can I get an amen? For we who have believed enter that rest. You are secure in knowing that you're going to be entering God's rest. MacArthur says, Hearing the good news for the rest of God is of no benefit, no profit to any person unless the hearing is united by faith. Hearing it is just knowledge in your ear. Faith is an action that is required from you, put your faith and trust in Him. One other point I want to make here. The rest promised to those who believe is my rest. That is God's rest. 
God's own rest from His work of creation and the rest that He gives us in Christ are not, the, are not the rest brought on by weariness or the rest of inactivity, but are the rest of a finished work. His works were finished before the foundation of the world. God has finished His work. God has done it all. And for anyone who wants to enter into His finished work and to share in His rest, it is available by faith. And it has been made available by God since He created the world. That's what it tells us here in these verses. It's finished. He has created it. It is done. So God's promise remains. You can enter His rest if you only believe. Okay, now let's look at number two. God's warning. He says in verses 5 through 7, And again in this passage He said, They shall not enter My rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news fail to because of disobedience, again He appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterwards, in the words already quoted, Today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Well, out of this verse, there's some good news and there's some bad news. There's some good news and there's some bad news. The good news is, it still remains. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it. The good news is, that there's an opportunity to enter God's rest. It still remains today. That's very good news for anyone who is a believer. Or as when I was in Ukraine for a while, or anyone who is called a repenter. That's what a Christian's called there. So if you are a believer and a repenter, there's still time. If you're not one, there's still time for you. God offered His rest to the Jews in David's time and to the Jews in Moses' time, and He offers it today to you. The bad news is, those who disobeyed God and never put their faith and trust in Him will never enter God's rest. And that's the bad news. I want you to focus at the end of verse 6 on the word disobedience, okay? Because of disobedience. I want to expand on this word a little bit here because we think of disobedience as a pretty narrow, or at least I do, if Troy asks me, if he's my coach and he says, hey, Danny, uh, get out there and give me uh, 12 laps from the hockey rink. And um, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. That would be outright disobedience. That's kind of what we think about. This is more than that. This is deeper than that. It says... On what this means is it's an unwillingness to be persuaded. It's a willful unbelief. I don't even believe he has the authority to tell me to go skate around the hockey rink. And not only that, I'm going to be completely obstinate to you about it. That's part, that's what this word, it's. It's a more of a willful disobedience. It's not just a casual act of, I don't want to do what my parents told me to do. This is willfully saying, I'm not going to believe you. You can't, be, you can't persuade me, and I don't even think you have the authority to do it because I'm my own man. That's who these were. That's the those who received the good news and failed to enter because of disobedience. That's the kind of disobedience that we're talking about here. So let me ask you, why are people obstinate to the message of Christ? They why? They don't think it applies to them. They don't think they need salvation. Okay, so don't, don't see a need for it in their life. Okay? What's another? Yeah. Okay, so they're proud of their own way of living. think they don't need a Savior. Say it again. Okay, so they, their eyes are they're sealed. They have scales on their eyes. They don't even see it. it. Hasn't been lifted. Yeah. Okay, so there's a humility and submission that's required in the Christian faith in many areas of the Christian faith, but the most important one would obviously be your first one, and that is to submit to Christ. So they're unwilling to submit, which would mean that you have to come under the authority of someone else. What else? What's another one? Romans 1.28 says, God gave them over to the depraved mind. Okay. So some have already been given over because they've 
are so caught up in the sin that they're a part of and they have willfully chosen to follow that, ignore God, and it goes on and continues on Romans 1 and it gets even worse paragraph by paragraph, doesn't it? What's another? What's another reason? Yeah. Well, if they admit that there is no authority, a higher authority, then they have to admit that they themselves have failed to come under it or transgressed the authority. Yeah. And, and then if you admit that there is a God, then you've admitted there is a higher authority, and then you have to submit to the at least the moral code of that God, um, and you're not willing to do that, so let's just extinguish Him before that happens. What else? Salvation is free, but obedience is costly. Okay, there's a cost that comes with it. People do not want to change their sinful ways. There's some seed that's planted by the thorny, and it gets crushed out or choked out and don't, do not want to leave their sinful ways. That's another. I think sometimes people are fearful of loss of friends, the people they're around. Uh, if I come to know Christ and I'm not, who am I going to have to be around so they don't even want to address that in their life? There are many reasons that this occurs, but it is, it is this word of disobedience here is what ultimately it is. It is this unwillingness to be persuaded. It is this willful unbelief. But in this case, in our text, very clearly, the author is telling us that today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear His voice, there's an immediacy to this calling. There's a requirement for action immediately within you. So you see, you see this emphasis there, not waiting for another opportunity, not putting it off. Today is the day to believe, and today is the day to enter God's rest. I want you to turn over to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28 in your Bible. I want to, I, I want to just give you a couple of verses of where this came up again. Uh, very much Paul here has uh, been shipwrecked. Um, he has been, um, the Jewish community has had him arrested. He is now going to be under house arrest in Rome until Caesar uh, will hear his trial. In fact, it never happens, but that's what he's waiting on. He just arrives in Rome, and in Acts chapter 28, um, he is there under house arrest. He has a few people with him, including Luke, obviously, because he's writing the book, and a few others. And he calls the Jewish leaders to come see him. They come to see Paul, and they say, he asked them, have you heard about me and what's going on? And they say, no, actually, we haven't received any news about you, but we know about this thing called the way, the new Christian faith. And he, they said, uh, we'd like to hear more. And he said, okay, we'll set a time. You come back tomorrow and, we'll, and I'll share that with you. So the Jewish leaders, and we'll pick up in verse 23, the Jewish leaders are there. And I give you this because I, I, I talked to one of the uh, uh, elders about this this week, and it's like, it's as if Paul, I'm not saying Paul wrote the book. I don't know who wrote the book. But it's as if Paul stepped in and this message that we're studying in chapter 4 is like what Paul is about to share with the Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 28. Okay, Listen to, listen to what he does. So a time was set, and on that day a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. Those people are Jews, okay, non-believing Jews. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the Scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. That's what we see here in Hebrews chapter 4. This persuasion, today is the day of salvation. He uses Moses, he uses Joshua. Okay, Paul is doing this as well. 24, some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. After they had argued back and forth among themselves, so this is within the Jewish group, they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when He said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, Go and say to, the, to, these, to this people, When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of the people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear. And they have closed their eyes, 
so their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. This is the unbelieving Jew hearing the message of Christ by Paul the Apostle. Some believed, but others turned away. They heard the gospel. They heard the gospel presentation by Paul the Apostle. And that's going to be a pretty good gospel presentation, if you know what I mean. Okay? Paul is sharing this with them. He understands the Old Testament as well as anyone. And then he's also had this time with Christ and he's been ministering to both the Jews and the Gentiles and sharing the gospel and performing many times in different sermons along the way. Shipwrecked. He's healed men and women. And yet he shares his message and some believe and some turn away. Paul is making the plea to the Jewish brethren just like they do here in chapter 4. Today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your hearts. Today is the day. So that was God's warning in verses 5 through 7. So let's look at the last part, and this is God's rest, verses 8 through 10. Back in Hebrews chapter 4, God's rest. Hebrews 8, 9 and 10. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. You see, Joshua was the one that led them into the promised land. And Psalm 95 was written after Joshua. So the point being made here is that they still have not entered God's rest. If they had, there would have been no need to write what was written in Psalm 95. It would have already occurred. Now what kind of rest were the Israelites looking for? They were looking for physical rest. They were looking for rest from their enemies. They were looking for rest from, as we studied in 2 Samuel, the Amor. Amorites and the Edomites and whatever kind of ites there were, he was the one, David was the one having to battle each one of those. So there was not rest in the promised land. That land was under attack. And Joshua here is an example. It said that land, it didn't bring them rest. The only true rest will come not through Joshua and not through any other man. It can only come through Christ and belief in Him. When David wrote Psalm 95, it was long after Joshua, again proving Joshua had not fulfilled the promise of divine rest. The Psalms, if so, the Psalms warning to David would not have been necessary. The rest promised by God is not physical. It is spiritual. It is eternal. He does not promise us a life without suffering. He does not promise us a life without facing the difficulties of being an outsider an alien in a world being influenced by Satan. But what he does promise us are two different kinds of rest. Okay, Two different kinds of rest. Number one is present rest. Those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ, we receive what I'll call present rest. Okay? Matthew eleven twenty eight through 29 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and lean, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You now have rest from the, attempt, the, the empty attempts to work, out, work our way to salvation. Instead, we have received salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to those who believe. We have that rest. We have a Savior. We have been reconciled to a holy God through the covering of the blood and the sacrifice of Christ. You have rest through the promises that are made to us. He promises us peace that passes all understanding. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. He promises us that He has overcome the world. He promises to lead us and direct us. He promises to strengthen us and give us power. He promises to give us wisdom. 
And he promises that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Presently, we are able to rest in our assurance of salvation. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, But I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You cannot be separated from Christ if you have put your faith and trust in Him. Cannot happen. If you're going to the second service, Dr. Dr. Lawson will confirm that for you. He will confirm that. It's kind of better if you go first because then you've heard him and like then you come in here, I confirm. It's, it's better to think of, I'm just confirming him, right? So don't tell him I said that. It also says in John 10, 27 through 29, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Impossible. Cannot happen for you. Your present rest comes with an assurance of salvation. Grab on to that with both hands. Okay? Grab on to it. But there's also, number two, a future rest. The rest that's mentioned in verse 9 is a different word than all the other references to rest so far. It is called Sabbath rest or sabbatical. Okay? It is the Sabbath rest. It's different than any other. This word is sabbatiso. It means to keep the Sabbath. It means to rest as, a, as on the Sabbath. And in the New Testament, it's used only of, a, of an eternal rest with God. The only time that word is used in the New Testament, every time it means <clears throat> an eternal rest with God. Therefore, the Sabbath was instituted as a symbol of that eternal rest of God's completed work. Okay? Eternal rest. Verse, let me go back. Hebrews 4 9 says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, those who believe. You will receive a Sabbath rest. Just as when God completed his work of creation, he rested. The same will be true for us. When we have completed our work on this earth, we too will be done. We will rest just as God rested. Our rest will be with Him in His presence. It will be a glorious day. We will be at rest from all the suffering, from all the pain, from all the trials, from all the tribulations. We will be with the Lord. One verse that's referenced uh, is, in response to this is Revelations 14, 13. <clears throat> Both Sproul and MacArthur um, put this verse in right here with, verse, uh, with uh, Hebrews 4, 9. Revelation 14 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit. Here you go. That they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. For they may rest from their labors. Those are what the blessed are going to receive. This is a reminder to all of us. We're not in the future rest. You're not to be sitting around. Okay? We're still in the six days of creation if you want to look at it that way. We have work to be done. Don't miss this. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Future rest is coming. Present rest, assurance of salvation is there for us today, but we are still about His work. That hasn't changed. For those who believe, we have a present rest. A rest in Christ our Savior, and we also have a future rest with the Almighty God for all of eternity. Present and future rest for each of you. So, summary. Have you entered into God's rest? Are you secure in your salvation? For those who do not believe, they have rejected Christ and His offer of saving grace. But if you do believe, then you're one of His. I want to tell you, this is not going to get any easier for you. Warning number five is what happens if you reject Christ. 
So this is kind of the soft approach today. When we get to chapter 10 and we talk about rejecting Christ. Chapter 10 says, For we know Him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. And here's the, here's the phrase that you've heard before, I bet. It is, ter- it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For those who do not know Him, it's a terrifying thing. That's why it says in verse 1, Let us fear if you have not entered into God's rest. It should be a fearful thing. Make today the day you put your faith and trust in Him. Now, if you have entered into God's rest, are you about His work? God's example of creation was one who worked diligently and then rested. We must follow this example and work diligently as He has called us to do. God has a calling for you. God has a ministry for you. God has a gift for you to use for His glory. I hope that you'll I hope you know what that is, and I hope you will embrace it. Secondly, the remedy given to us for this warning about unbelief and disobedience is that we must be encouraging and exhorting unbelievers to put their faith and trust in Christ. It doesn't say that you, you know, if you'll just do it three times, that'll be enough. <clears throat> There's not a number given to us to when we can give up. It's a word of action that is continuing action, exhorting and encouraging. Every Sunday, pretty much every Sunday for the four years that we've been at this church and for 20 years I was at another church with Dr. Lawson, every sermon ends with a plea for you to be saved. Every sermon. I really can't remember. Even when the clock rang 12 o'clock, he's still going to give you a plea to be saved in case there's just one person in this church today who doesn't know Him, doesn't know Christ. That's exhorting and encouraging, and I pray that that will be a part of who you are. We know that salvation is not up to us. We do not have the capacity to save anyone. Only God can save, and all have been chosen before the foundation of the world. That's the foundational belief of this church. Still, He commands us to share the gospel hope to a dying world. Commands us. It's not an option. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your heart revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you, On Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You are the mouthpiece for God. You're His His ambassador to this world. And lastly, Mark 16, 15 says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's the command. That's what you're to do, and that's what I'm to do. Now, one more review. Tell me, what what is Christ superior to? What are some of the things that we talked about earlier and then last spring? What are some of the things Christ is superior to? Tell me. The angels. He's superior to the angels. What else is He superior to? Moses. Sorry? Moses. Moses. Okay. Okay. We'll include the patriarchs in that. <clears throat> He's superior to that. Superior to the law. Okay. Goes on and on. But today, I want you to think in terms of He is superior in the rest that He gives. The rest given in the Old Testament was a physical rest. It was the land of Canaan. And as this message was being given to the Jews, they would understand that we've just moved from a physical rest to now an eternal and a spiritual rest that can only come through Christ. His rest is superior to the rest that the Jews believed in, the non-Christian Jews. And that rest is available to you and to I and to me, that eternal rest. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for the words that You've given to us of Hebrews. I pray for the hearts of each one here this morning that there would be an assurance of the salvation that is given to us through Your Son. 
the lifting of the scales from our eyes and from the softening of the heart so that everyone in this room would come to know you. So Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that today for them would be the day of salvation. For those of us who do know you, who do believe and put our trust and faith in you, I pray that we would be about your work and that we would be encouraging and exhorting others to come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you for your time that you've given to us to study, to teach, to discuss. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.